what does it mean for two matrices to be equal? Well, we define the idea of equality of two matrices if they had the same size, so they were both m by n, and then every component on the one matrix was equal to its corresponding component on the other. So for example, the aij on the one matrix was equal to the bij on the other for all relevant i and j's. I'm going to give you a different notion, not a quality of matrices. I'm going to call it similarity of matrices. So I'm going to have two matrices. I'm not claiming that they're identical. They could have different numbers. But I'm going to claim that they're similar in some important aspect. And the definition is going to seem a little bit strange at first, but I'll explain why it is and why it's useful. So the definition is this. I am claiming that a matrix A and a matrix B, that those are similar matrices, and I use the little tilde sign for similarity, if you can find this invertible matrix P, and then it has the relationship that, that the one matrix, the A, can be written as P times B times P inverse. By the way, I can also write this in a slightly different way that's completely equivalent, namely, Suppose I multiply on the left of both sides by P inverse. So I'd get on the left hand side, it would be P inverse times A. And then I would have like P inverse times P, but the inverse times P is just the identity matrix. So I wouldn't have anything. And I'd be left with B. And then I'm going to do the same trick where I'm going to multiply now the right hand sides both by the matrix P. And on the left, this is going to mean that I get a P off on its right hand side. And on the right, on the right hand side, there's going to be a P inverse times a P again, it's going to cancel, just become the identity matrix. So you can rearrange it like this, it doesn't really matter. Now I'm using a bit of a pretentious word, I'm saying that this property is defined as similarity. So I should really only call it similar matrices if these matrices really share a bunch of important properties to us. And indeed, that's going to be the case. Similar matrices are really quite equivalent on a long list of different properties. One of them is going to be, for example, the rank of the matrix A is equal to the rank of the matrix B. But the next one I'm going to show is really important for our computation of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. For example, let me come along here and take the determinant of A minus lambda I. Now, why am I even beginning to be interested in this? Of course, the determinant of A minus lambda I was a part of how we computed eigenvalues. We would say that the determinant was going to be equal to zero, and then we would say what lambdas gave that equation being equal to zero. That was how we found eigenvalues. So to figure out the determinant of a minus lambda i is a really important thing, so that's what I'm going to study. Now, I can substitute this equation in for the value of a. I can say that this is the same thing as the determinant of this invertible matrix p times b times p inverse minus lambda, and then I'm going to give a little bit of a pause here for just a moment because notice that p times p inverse is just the identity. And I can always put an identity in the middle of that. So I think I can do the same thing here. I could take that p and p inverse, and I'm not really doing anything. It's, it's kind of like multiplying by a number and one over the number. They're going to cancel, so it doesn't matter. p times p inverse, I can commute these matrices, and they're going to cancel to be the identity matrix. So I'm allowed to do this little algebraic trick. And then I'm going to do some further algebra here. I'm going to say that this is the determinant of, well, I'm going to put a P all the way out the front, because I noticed that there's a, a P out the front of both of these expressions, so I'm going to factor it out. That's going to leave me with a B minus lambda I. And then I also have a P inverse on the right-hand side of both of these expressions, and so I'm allowed to factor that out as well. So I'm just factoring out the common factor of P, and the p inverse. All right, now I'm going to use a convenient fact about determinants. Namely, the determinant of a product is the product of the individual determinants. So for example, this is a determinant really of three things, a p, this b minus lambda i, and this p inverse. And so I'm going to write it that way. I'm going to say it's the determinant of p. It's the determinant of this b minus lambda i and it's the determinant of p inverse. So the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. One final thing, having to dig into the memory banks about all the different properties of determinants here, 
Another property was that the determinant of a matrix is going to be 1 over the determinant of the inverse. So this determinant p is just some number, right? And then the determinant of p inverse is 1 over that number, so I can cancel the two of them. And that just leaves me with the determinant of b minus lambda i. The takeaway is this. These two things that I have, the determinant of a minus lambda i and the determinant of b minus lambda i, those are the important crucial ingredients in figuring out the eigenvalues for either a or for b. And it turns out that this equation, this equation where you're solving for lambda, you're setting it equal to zero, that that equation is identical regardless of whether it's the matrix A or B. So they are going to have the same eigenvalues. And this is even true counting with multiplicity. Uh, say if the eigenvalue of 2 appeared and the eigenvalue of 2 appeared three times for A, then the eigenvalue of 2 is going to appear in the computation for b, and it's going to appear three times as well. Now, there are many different properties like this where similar matrices result in similar properties, but we had to be a little bit careful. For example, eigenvectors, those do change. It's the eigenvalues that remain the same. Now, these expressions like p inverse ap is equal to b can seem at first glance a little bit strange. So, I want to give you an example of one way that expressions like this might occur. And I want you to think about change of basis. Imagine you've got some basis b, and that you've got vectors x that are written in terms of that basis b. And then I want you to imagine that the, the matrix p here that we're specifying, that this p matrix is the change of basis that takes your vector written in the b basis and puts it into the standard basis. So then, if I take one of these expressions, how about I do the right one, the p inverse ap, and I'm going to say that this is equal to b. Well, if I apply this particular matrix to some vector x that's being written in that b basis, I'm going to apply it like this, then on the left-hand side, what we really have is three different things. And the first component of it, where you take the, the vector written in the b basis, you multiply it by p, that puts it into the standard basis. So what I've got identified here, the p times the xb, that's in the standard basis. And then when you multiply it by a, a is some linear transformation. It tells you how you manipulate things in the standard basis. So you've taken your vector x, you've put it in the standard basis, now you manipulate it by the matrix a, it does whatever the matrix a is going to be doing, and then you apply p inverse, and p inverse is going to put it back into the b basis. So whenever you have a linear transformation, like this transformation a, where it's thought of as manipulating something in the standard basis, then if you have some vector in some other basis, you can apply this p inverse ap to transform it into the standard basis, to apply the linear transformation a, and then to put it back into your basis b. And that's just one example of where similar matrices might arise.